for us. Good afternoon, friends. I'd like to welcome you to What's in Tegan's Storage Locker. It's the show that dares to ask the question, just what is in my storage locker? The answer today, well, friend, the answer is comics. The answer is always going to be comics. I grab a pile of comics from around, and we look through them here on the screen, hopefully for your pleasure. All right, so the first thing I'd like to do is to invite you to take a look at the Patreon. If you like this video, if you like anything I do, that's how you show your appreciation. I got decades worth of my writing up there uh, for you to download and enjoy uh, at your leisure. I'm also putting up new videos on this channel where I look at new comics. They're called Hey Tegan, What's in the Bag? I come home from the comic book store every Wednesday after I spend way too much money and we run down uh, just what I have purchased. All right, so let's start off. Let's start off with the classics. The Batman Adventures, the very first uh, Batman animated uh, series comic book adaptation. There were many, but the Batman Adventures was the first one that launched in uh, 93, I think. And it still has uh, three names here who would be closely associated with all of DC's animated adaptation books. Kelly Puckett, Mike Parabek, Rick Burchett. Those three right there. Any of them on a book worth checking out. All three of them, you have a Hall of Famer on your hands, friend. Rick Taylor, colorist Tim Harkins, letterer. All right. So, oh, this Justice League Task Force game. I remember this because this was a fighting game where you were uh, all the members of the Justice League and a couple of the villains. And it was a really balanced fighting game. I remember it didn't matter who you picked. Every, every character uh, could could hold their own. But then you play it for a while and you realize, oh, Green Arrow, he's doing really well against Superman and Wonder Woman. Maybe um, maybe it's not completely comics accurate. So that looks like Hugo Strange we're dealing with here. I think Hugo Strange. Look at this. Wow. I mean, that's why these, especially this first generation of animated series adaptation books, were so strong because they practically looked like storyboards themselves in terms of just how clean and clear. Look at this. This right here in terms of showing you a lot of information about what Batman's doing, what he sees, you know, him traveling through this hole in the window, somersaulting onto the ground. That is just an amazing sequence right there. Oh, goodness, Casper. That is a, this is a morbid movie. For a kid's movie, Casper is just way too morbid, man. Oh, and this ad. No, I'm not taking those candies out of your hand, dude. Stop trying to give me your spree. Oh, well, that's nice. <laughs> she lures him for a date. <laughs> not my favorite version of Catwoman, simply because I don't think Catwoman was very de developed on the animated series. That was, you know, one uh, weakness of it is it was definitely going from an older version of Catwoman, and I think the character as she has evolved. But, you know, the reason she evolved in the 21st century was partly because of how she looked here. You can't say that this look did not have an influence on the Darwin Cook look that followed the, um, uh, the Jim Balin era. Oh, and not just Batman Forever, but Batman Forever metallic trading cards. I think I remember I bought a pack of, the, of this just because they looked weird, and they do look weird. All of them like this, this mid-90s, uh, where everything looks like it's run through a really bad digital filter, and that's what people wanted. <laughs> uh. So he's just watching as she's stealing things. That's sort of Batman. Oh, he's having flashbacks while he... See, this, this is a good story. 
I would, I would want to go back and, and reread this because it looks like it's got some layers. And that's something that's true of, of this Batman series is, is that a surprisingly high percentage of the scripts for a kid's cartoon were, were kind of um, spooky puzzles. <laughs> a lot of mysteries. That's actually some of the better, wow, some of the better use of actual mysteries. Uh, in Batman media, Batman the Animated Series. My God. And this is issue 34. This is just a random issue of this series, and it is one of the most gorgeous Batman comic books that has ever been made. With a interesting, multi-tiered story. You know... I don't want to sound like I'm just another old person waxing poetic about Batman the Animated Series, but it really was a step above in a lot of ways. Uh, it wasn't the Batman, I think, that a lot of people wanted at the time, and this, this sort of gets effaced by history because it turned out to be so popular. But when it came out, uh, there was a lot of guff uh, thrown in the direction of the fact that it looked like a more cartoony Batman. It didn't look like Frank Miller. Well, it did look like David Mazzuchelli, though, is the thing. But it took a while, I think, also for David people to come around to David Mazzuchelli. I mean, go back. Rather famously, uh, the Batman book printed le letters from readers Wow, that is a very distinctive look on Batman's face there. I don't think I've ever seen Batman making that facial expression before. <laughs> My God. Uh, what was I saying? I was just completely distracted by this. Uh, this look that Batman is giving us. <sighs> Man, they were really pushing Batman Forever. What can, I mean, it made a lot of money. This this movie surprised a lot of people. You, you can't say it enough. This movie wasn't necessarily supposed to be the big success it was. Uh, it was on paper, hitting into it. Warner Brothers was trying to cut their losses and make a Batman movie kind of on the cheap because they didn't want to just fold after you know, Batman uh, returns, but they weren't expecting this to be as huge as it was, and certainly that created its own problems because then they gave uh, Schumacher a blank check and he made the wonderfully, the, the delightfully weird Batman and Robin, a movie that I will praise to the heavens until the day I die. Every frame of that movie is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, it is not, again, again, it, it was not the Batman people wanted in 1996. It, it existed in a universe where uh, Frank Miller was probably still drawing uh, Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> My goodness, though. Look at this. Just look at how good this looks. Although, what's going on with their arm here? Is this kosher? I can't tell. That maybe looks a bit a bit Dutch to me, but what do I know? And see, it was popular enough for them to be hawking the VHS tapes. Nice Kirby crackle on the machine there. That's, a, that's an important element in the, the DNA of the animated series because it wasn't, it wasn't really uh, overt. Like it would be later on in Batman the Brave of the Bold, which definitely has a very big Kirby elements on it but there were some kirby grace notes in the animated series style it just fit very seamlessly into the milieu but you know they took a lot of influences to make such a classic look yeah this well i mean it's hugo strange hugo strange stories are, are going to be you know weird ones for you i mean Hugo Strange was behind Twin Peaks. That, that's, that's canon. It's, it's canon because I'm saying it's canon. It's never been actually confirmed, but, you know. Let's see, do I recognize any of these names here? I do. I do. 
Eric Reynolds at the Comics Journal. Finally, months after receiving recommendation after recommendation, I took home about 20 issues of the Batman Adventures and read most of them in one sitting, with the exception of Mike Alred's Madman comics. TBA is the only superhero comic I've read in years that recaptures the excitement and imagination that the genre held for me as a child. Simply put, if all superhero comic books were as well-crafted, he, we, we here wouldn't have anything to complain about. And they, they put complain in... Uh, uh, Scare quotes here, so or not scare quotes in um, brackets. So I, I'm sure that he used a more spicy word, but high praise indeed, especially from the one place I never expected to get a, a darn letter. <laughs> That's great. I wonder if he remembers that he did that. And you see, you see, straight up, like this is that good. And this stuff is still in print. If you see any of these original Batman adventures, series uh you know any of the trades or i think they probably done it in omnibus definitely definitely absolutely 100 percent recommended all right what do we got oh i got one here's a fun one for you generation x we've looked at some generation x because generation x was a, a very nice looking book that didn't look like anything else uh, coming from Marvel at the time because they got Chris Piccolo straight off of Vertigo. So even though it was very much an X-Men book where they're doing X-Men things, it it was one of the first books, maybe not the first book, because you also had, you know, the uh, Hellstorm book, uh, the Druid book, you know, a couple of James Demetis titles. Uh, it's not like no one at Marvel, was playing around in that sort of kind of vertigo space. But it didn't seem to be anywhere near as organized, basically, you know, up to individual creators and, and editors on individual projects. Uh, so a book like Generation X, it had a vertigo artist, and it had a different feel, but it still kind of read like an X-Men book, which is, you know... My memory is that it was a gorgeous book that you love to flip through, but nothing ever happened in it. And, you know, the example of this was, was Mondo, the character who was advertised as premiering with the team. Well, they didn't get around to joining the team until, like, a year was up. Uh, and it felt like just everything was dragging like that. And you could say, okay, well, it was dragging because they were doing mood pieces and character work. Okay, that's not nothing. Uh, but at the same time, oh my goodness, look at that. Look at that. Yep. Yep. That's this. There's Mondo. So, uh, Mondo's gone, gone rogue. He's trying to kill Sean. I mean, honestly, you don't necessarily need to go rogue to, to be fed up with Banshee. He's just, he's kind of traditionally a, a useless sob um he can't really seal the deal on anything he he's fumbled you know emma frost more more mctaggart uh he's just kind of a pitiful soul there's, there's there's nothing more to it and i do not believe that an actual irishman would have any use for the boston celtics i'm i'm sorry i'm sorry and there's Black Tom Cassidy. Yeah, he. This is uh, when they started really changing him, uh, visually making him more of a a plant guy. Uh, back to I think his appearances in X Force was when that first started. I want to say. I want to say. But look at that. This. This is a nice, nice looking comic book. Well, speak of the devil and she will appear. Uh, I'm not going to go on another anti-white queen rant. I still say once you've burned down a horse barn with the horses in it, that probably uh, disqualifies you from the X-Men. I'm sorry. That to me is just, uh, that's, that's, that's mustache twirling villainy. Uh, 
of a kind that I, I can't forgive. Jubilee, look at this. Just look at how nice looking this comic is. Oh, Bastion. So Bastion shows up to save her from Mondo. But she doesn't know who Bastion is yet. She's about to know who Bastion is. I think we've looked at one of the issues after she's been kidnapped. Because she stays kidnapped by Bastion for a while by you know, Operation Zero Tolerance. And the subscription form is still chugging along. Still fairly, you know, it's it's got books that aren't long for this world. The Ultra Force. I do not know how long Ultra Force lasts, but it doesn't last very long. Uh, Kazar, I think Kazar lasts like 19 issues, 18 or 19 issues. Still four Spider-Man books, still four monthly Spider-Man books. Imagine that. I don't think they could float four monthly Spider-Man books today if they wanted to. They just double or triple ship amazing, and that's been the policy since the, the mid-2000s. But... Uh, well, there's the man himself. I remember they just had uh, Howard the Duck hanging out for a while in their uh, backyard with Beverly Switzer, uh, Leach and uh, Artie, Franklin Richards, because his parents were dead. Uh, they were. This was during Heroes Reborn, so his parents were off being drawn by Jim Lee as we speak putting out fire with gasoline. And for some reason, Howard the Duck just ended up with this group. And I think that was Tana Nile of the Rigelians for who knows why. Uh, it maybe doesn't make that much sense, but if you ever wanted to see Black Tom Cassidy facing off against Howard the Duck, here we go. Oh, but he did not remember that <laughs> Leech is sitting right there. Oh, but wait a minute. He, he's <laughs> Howard the Duck is just going to set him on fire. Oh, that's great. That's fantastic. I forgot all about this. He just gets out a can of gas, and he just douses Black Tom Cassidy and all his vegetation in, uh, in gasoline. I got your delight right here, pal. Uh, I can't do a Cleveland. I know, I know I can't do a Cleveland, so I'm not even going to try to do a, a good Cleveland accent. But Howard the Duck should sound straight off the streets of Cleveland. And I still can't believe we almost had, we almost had a Harvey Pekar Howard the Duck story. We came this close, and it was literally... Harvey Pekar's schedule in the 80s that prevented it from happening. I cannot believe that. Why no one ever thought to circle back on that one? Because it, it would have been... I'm sorry. Maybe I'm just freaked out about it. But I would have enjoyed it. He's one of the few people who I, I would have accepted for the character in lieu of... Well, speaking of Steve Gerber, it's the man thing as well. And I think this was around the time of the uh, James Demetis Man thing, which was, you know, one of those Vertigo-ish books. It had uh, Liam Sharp on uh, pencils for it. Now, if I recall correctly, uh, it didn't last as long as they wanted it to. And I've seen them on social media, because I follow both James Demetis and uh, Liam Sharp. They've spoken of wanting to work together again. I don't know if they would work together on man things simply because I don't know if Marvel would, would pay Liam Sharp as much as he's worth to draw man thing. I mean, in a perfect world, yes. In the world we live in, I don't know. Liam Sharp isn't really doing anything for Marvel, even variants right now. And that could change at any moment. He's been kind of busy with Spawn, but Virtual Cop 2, twice as lethal. All right. Virtual on Cyber Troopers. Sega Saturn, short-lived. 
but just page after page. The forgotten mutant known as Penance. And I still, from what I understand, they have made the situation even more complicated in recent years. Uh, the whole Ammon Penance thing, it was, a, it was, frankly, a drag on the book. You know, it should have lasted a year, tops. It lasted a lot longer than a year. And that was just how they worked at the time. They had mysteries that went on in perpetuity. And it, it ruined years of comics because that was the only way people knew how to write. That was all Howard Mackey knew how to do. Man, look at this. Spooky stuff, man. Tell me what you want me to do. Kill her. The White Queen. Now. I'm not going to attempt an Irish accent because I don't want to be accused of committing hate crimes. Uh, my name is O'Neill. I know better than to try. Uh... Oh, so Black Tom Cassidy, is he controlling them with spores or some such? Sean, I am already responsible for one group of students dying on my watch. Yes, which is a good reason why it was a mistake to give you another. Plus the horses. I couldn't live through that again. Oh, yeah, Emma would be sad if another group of children in her care died due to her negligence. Oh, look, just look at this. My God. My God. Now again, if I were to stop and, and pay attention to the word balloons, I, I don't know if I would necessarily be quite so pleased with it. But, uh, you know, such is life. Oh, and here's the rest of the team who were... Something happened to you. Something happened to you people. Uh, form, skin, sink, husk, and chamber. They were in a bubble at the bottom of the ocean. Their nightmare has just begun. Our special fear-filled 25th issue was brought to you by Mr. Scott Labdell and Mr. Chris Bacalo. A company was provided by Mr. Alvey and Scott Hanna. No wonder it looked good. They didn't have a bunch of substitutes working in here. Both Alve and Scott Hanna are pros who knew what they were doing. Special atmospheric effects by Starkings, Comicraft, and Vancata. Your stage manager was Bob Harris. Lifeboat and Jubilee in the clutches of Bastion. And I don't recognize any names on the letters page. Oh, and yeah, you know this is Heroes Reborn because they're really hawking... Kazar by uh, uh, Mark Wade and uh, Andy Kubert, which I have to admit, when the, that team was on it, it was a very nice looking book. It was about as readable as Kazar ever is, which is only incidentally, like the Bruce Jones Kazar is very good. I don't think it necessarily made me care about Kazar as a character. I don't think Bruce Jones liked Kazar. If you ask me straight up, this is like over 40 year old T, but I, I think that Bruce Jones actively disliked Kazar and kept trying to separate him from Shanna. <laughs> that, that's the feel you get from going back and reading that run of comics. But see, it, it looked nice. Some, some artists, some artists really like drawing dinosaurs. And even if it was just this one project, it looks like Andy Cooper was having fun drawing dinosaurs here. Uh, oh, and every now and again they do a thriller on a airplane. And I know this one would be weird because it's a whole different security regime uh, before the turn of the century there. I, I remember, I think, enjoying this at the time, but I don't remember anything about it. All right. Was there a, there was a bullpen bulletins, wasn't there? 
Yeah. Oh, Excalibur. They're still pushing Excalibur with Ben Rab and Salvador La Roca when Salvador La Roca was still in his early days. And as I've said before, if you want to see good work from Salvador La Roca, go, go back and check out his work in the 90s before he was uh, tracing so much. And, and you see, he was definitely you know cut from the same kind of mold as Carlos Pacheco. And I remember this was an improvement on the book at the time, simply because Warren Ellis had been writing Excalibur. And Warren Ellis didn't really have, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, any respect for these characters at all. The, uh, the scuttlebutt was that he didn't really remember their names when he was writing the scripts. I don't know whether that was true or not. But it was, uh, the book had a little bit more direction after he left. But I want to say Excalibur had Carlos Pacheco on it during that period as well, which is probably why I was still buying it. Uh, while, the world, while the New York Yankees were winning the 1996 World Series, some of the greats of the comic book industry were doing some working and partying at their own at the Dynamic Forces Convention at the New York Hyatt. Report, reports are that a gaggle of comics people gathered after the con to have dinner schmooze and basically frighten all the normal people in Midtown with post-convention craziness. Mentionable moments included writer and all-around performer Todd DeZago meeting both his sensational Spider-Man collaborator Mike Wairingo and all-new cable penciler Randy Green and future Witchblade penciler Randy Green. He's, who, he's the guy who takes over for Michael Turner for the first time face-to-face -face, and Kazar writer Mark Wade uh, relating the most horrifying entry in the roundtable discussion of what was your worst date ever. Uh, now I want to hear that story. <laughs> Uh, it seems DC executive editor and all-around super guy Mike Carlin has been showing up at the Marvel offices lately, usually in mysterious meetings with editors Ralph Macchio and Tom Brevoort, who coincidentally all have been working with DC on the all-access limited series that's been crossing over Marvel and DC characters. And those were fun. They did the, a couple all-access series after the Marvel and DC event, and they, the stakes were a bit lower. So there was, they were a little bit more fun, I think. Uh, Marvel versus DC is a, a remarkably flat event, uh, kind of unavoidable considering all it had to accomplish. Uh, so Incredible Hulk 451, we're in the Peter David era with Mike Daydotto Jr. Mike Daydotto Jr., he's on it for about a year, I want to say. Issue 5, The Heroes Are Born Iron Man, still got Wills Portacio, and I've said before, if any of the Heroes Are Born books are buried treasures worth going back and checking up on, uh, the Iron Man one with the Wills Portacio art qualifies. Uh, oh, X-Men 25. We've looked at that. X-Men 25. Um, and this is from the same period where Shang-Chi was appearing in the X-Men and they were fighting the Hellfire Club and the Kingpin. S still had Star Trek books with the uh, Starfleet Academy series by Chris Cooper and Chris Renault. Uh, Chris Cooper, he's the, the guy who wrote the, the Dark Hole book, and he actually won an Emmy for a television series about birdwatching a couple years back, if I recall correctly. Uh, oh, Daredevil Batman by DJ Chichester and Scott McDaniel. Uh... The Adventures of Snake Plissken. I don't remember that at all. The kick-butt action hero from Escape from New York stars in his first comic book adventure. The U.S. government sends an unstoppable cyborg killer to terminate Snake, a cyborg who's based on Snake himself, by Len Kaminsky and Ron Wiggum. Now that's interesting. If you've read the original run of Deathlock by Herb Trimpey, you see uh, portions from that run could serve as uh, storyboards for the Escape from New York. It takes a lot from that book, specifically the original Deathlock, as drawn by Herb Trimpey. So it makes sense if Snake Plissken would come to comic books, it would be in a Marvel comic book, but they didn't get Herb Trimpey to draw it. All right. All right, here's a fun one. I reach in the uh, box to find something interesting. And what should meet my fingers? 
Not Brand Ech number 10 from 1968. Yes. And this is in, you know, terrible condition. That's why I paid probably three or four bucks for it uh, when I got it. So this is actually, I think, a compilation, issue 10 of Not Brand Ech. Uh, a compilation of some of the, the the better features in the series history. Not Brand Eck was Marvel's homegrown humor magazine, which uh, had all of the classic Marvel lineup working on it, except for Steve Ditko because he was already he was already out the door by then. But he actually did a couple uh, humor features for the back of Spider Man. So if you want to see his work in that mold. Uh, Someone spilled their coffee on this. I mean, many decades ago. Many decades ago. But like I say, there's a reason I paid like three bucks for it. So right off the bat, we got a Stanley and Jack Kirby Fantastical Four story. The Silver Burper featuring the far out fiendishness of Dr. Bloom. So, yeah, it's Kirby in, in funny mode. And Kirby can do funny. Here's Mr. Fantastic as a fire hydrant. And the Silver Surfer just uh, goes around burping in every panel. <laughs> I didn't say the jokes were good. <laughs> Gee willikers, it sounds like fun, fun, fun. Oh boy, this I needed. Shazam, not something Dr. Doom would say in the normal books. So they're just doing a... Uh, you know, doing a spoofer of their very famous run of uh, Fantastic Four, 58, 59, 60, where uh, Dr. Doom steals the Silver Surfer's power. And Johnny Storm gets turned into an ice cream cone, and the thing gets turned into Aunt May. Continue next ish and the next and the next and the next. And the aging Spidey Man, Peter Pooper versus Nat Man and Rotten. Oh man, Stanley and Mary Marie Severin. There you go. And here is, you know, Marie Severin doing her very best Wally Wood from the looks of it. You know, she, I mean, all the EC guys, not just her brother. All that is in her artistic DNA. So yeah, she could definitely work in that uh, old Mad Magazine mold. And that's why, you know, uh, lots of people's work appeared in Not Brand Eck. But I think the person who gets singled out for for special commendation in this, this series is uh, Marie Severin. So they get to spoof Batman. And, you know, to be fair, DC had their fair share of uh, Marvel parodies in their books over the years. When they started to figure out uh, that they were actually losing ground, you know, Superman was still number one, but uh, Spider-Man was creeping on the come up. And that was, uh, that was something that it was very, very interesting to see DC sort of come to grips with because the, to the tone and tenor of their Marvel uh, parodies changes from absolute um, mockery to, you know, slight respect, <laughs> a real emotional journey there. Yeah, so it's just just like every Will Elder story. There's a gag every panel, but she's doing a dead on John Romita. She can do that. You know, that's just how how good she was at, at her prime. Blemish's fate, his skin clears. This probably has radium in it or something. As bad as the as bad as the Stridex and stuff that they uh, marketed to the, the kids in my generation. I don't know if that stuff still gets carpet bombed on kids these days like it did when I was a kid. But this stuff probably just like tore your skin off. The original origin of Charlie America. If you don't like, please to blame Stanley, Roy Thomas, Tom Sutton. Not a completely uh, 
unfamiliar name to Marvel, but not one of the, the regular stable. And there's a little Annie Fanny. That that that's clever. Man, there's there's a lot of jokes. You see how many zap. You see how many word balloons are in each of these uh, panels, and each one of these word balloons is trying to sell a joke. <laughs> Gee, it's a good thing I heal fast. And Charlie America always carries around a garbage can lid. Blunder agents. <laughs> they were, uh, oh man, speaking of Wally Wood, they're, they're giving it to the Thunder Agents. There you go. Uh, Stanley, Gary Friedrich, and Marie Severin. So again, uh, someone trying to do Wally Wood, and there you go. It looks just like Wally Wood. It's stiff as a board <laughs> because a lot of his superhero stuff, it, it was very stiff. Uh, and his Thunder Agents material, which is revered, don't get me wrong, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to say you should necessarily go out of your way to put it at the top of your list, but if you come across it, it's Wally Wood doing superheroes, and it's an interesting take on superheroes. It's a downbeat in a way that even Marvel wasn't, because it didn't have its tongue in cheek. There's a reason why those guys get uh, revived now and again, although you can't really say they have much in the way of a constituency. Uh, so Nick Fury versus the Thunder Agents. Because the joke is that the Th Thunder Agents, just like Nick Fury, everything's an acronym. Uh, Bedraggle League of Nations Defenseless Encroachment Reserves, the Blunder Agents. The Thunder Agents gimmick uh, in the actual stories was that they work for the UN. And here are the various Thunder Agent stand-ins, just getting, you know, completely hosed. I'll make you a master of karate. Giant lifelike karate practice dummy. 99 cents. Now you can be taller instantly. Invisible lifty height pad. Now you can be taller instantly. Oh, the further back you go in these ads, the more they, they're just completely preying on the insecurities of these poor young children. Uh, and here is, oh, there's James Bond. And uh, no, that's not James, but that's the, that is the man from Oakland, his, his Russian pal. Uh, so another Roy Thomas, Tom Sutton joint. If Magneto should clobber us, and Magneto is spelled M-A-G-N-E-A-T dash O. So, man, there is just a lot. There are a lot of drawings on these pages. Tom Sutton is packing these things with spoofery. Oh, and there's the Doom Patrol. There you go. Move it positive, Dan. You think that barber is going to wait to trim my beard forever? <laughs> the Beast has these giant... Uh, word balloons that he's grabbing the um, the arrows from and just using his handles to clobber Magneto with. Pete Duncan, drop out. That looks fraught. My goodness, there you go. What were they just saying about all the words on the page? Comic books for sale, new list, new low prices. Howard Rogofsky. I've heard that name before. The Origin of Soar, Son of Schmoden, by Lee and Kirby, with Frank Gaikoa on inks. So, yeah, there's we're, we're just mocking Thor here. Jack Kirby's... Mocking one of his signature creations. Well, what do you know? It hath, it hath turned into a hammer, and my speech hath turned into a lisp. What goeth on here? Oh, that's terrible. Uh, 
But it, it looks like Kirby's Thor. To whom it may concern, you are now a god named Thor. Signed, Daddy. <laughs> Oh, it's the monkeys and Chairman Mao and LBJ and uh, I think he was Muhammad Ali now. Bob Dylan, a gorilla, Dr. Doom, uh, Aunt May, Don Knotts, can't be Don Knotts, Alfred E. Newman, uh, Frankenstein's monster, uh, the Munsters. J. Jonah Jameson, Ralph Cramden. There you go. J Jack Kirby doing some uh, rare celebrity caricature. If you ever wondered, hey, did Jack Kirby ever draw Bob Dylan? Friend, he sure did. Didn't draw much, but he did. And the end of it is Odin dancing with Jane Foster, which is kind of funny considering how that plot turns out. Squonk. And the origin of Forbush Man. Irving Forbush was a, a company mascot that actually was uh, first appeared in something or other, one of the magazines that Lead, one of the humor magazines that Lee did in the 50s that was a, you know, a mad ripoff because everyone did a mad ripoff. Marvel did multiple mad ripoffs. Marvel was still doing a mad ripoff in the early 80s with Crazy. Crazy lasted almost 100 issues. I think it made it to the 80s. More celebrity characters. Bobby Kennedy, LBJ, Charlie. Wow. Jack Kirby draws a, a um, interesting Charlie Brown, Santa Claus, and Woody Allen. So yeah, for, for Bush man, Irving Forbush, he's just an absolutely pitiful schmo. You never see his face because he's always having something happen to him, like someone's throwing a pot of pasta on his head, or a tuma's hitting him with a trident, you know. He's having to fight the juggernaut. Pardon me, sir. Have you seen any good villains lately? How'd you like a fat lip, wise guy? You know, New York humor at its finest. All right. 204 piece Revolutionary War soldier set, only 198. And all the kids were, would be disappointed because it's just little cardboard cutouts. But, you know, what do you expect for $1.98, even in this era's money? Boys, girls, women, men, if you need extra money and you know just 10 people, you can get started on this uh, multi-level marketing scheme. All right, so that was a fun change of pace. Okay, here's a weirdie. Uh, Winx Club comic, number one, debut issue. Uh, I did not buy this comic book. This comic came in a, a value pack. I don't know what to do with this. Uh, I don't know if the Winx still have any constituency. It comes with a Winx Club card. Uh, I could tell you that. Do I recognize any of the names in the credits? Uh, you know, I don't recognize a single one of these names on this editorial staff. So Winx was what? It was a a franchise with with fairies that look like Bratz dolls. Was was that the 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 gig? Uh, Look who's blossoming at Alfea. So, Bloom, is that one of the characters? Yeah, so they're interviewing the characters here. Biggest dream, to be the best possible fairy I can be. Oh, 
Okay, what is a collectible trading card game? Coming soon, the Winx trading card game. So they are, uh, they're, they're selling this hard to a very vulnerable demographic. What's the deal with all these cards? Sure, you've collected posters, stickers, and stuffed animals before, but these are totally different. Maybe you've seen some of the boys at school with their Yu-Gi-Oh cards. Yu-Gi-Oh isn't just for boys. Yu-Gi-Oh is for everyone. If I know nothing else about the heart of the cards, Stella style file, almost like magic glitter nail polish. Dying for some fab glittery nail polish but short on allowance? Create your own with my recipe. It is easy as magic. Your nails will shimmer and shine. And with a cute decoration, it makes a great gift for a BFF. So, you still have to have glitter and nail polish. You just are putting them together. I think most people could probably figure out to put those two things together. I think. I mean, this is aimed at very small children. But uh, if you're not old enough to figure that out, maybe you shouldn't be doing that. I don't know. I just think you're going to make a terrible mess. So, Winx Club comic book here. So, these fairies are doing something or other. Can you imagine a fairy school in a real castle? This rocks. I bet it does. And they're all dressed. You know, this, this is how everyone was dressed in the 2000s. Straight up. This is a weirdo... Um, Little girls comic from the mid two thousands, but this is this is what all the people on TV and the fashion magazines were wearing. Uh, so that that was probably a, you know a big draw right there, fashion forward as it were for the the preteen set. Kind of amazing how well they they nailed that sartorial era with these toy designs. So there's some kind of magic. I'm not going to try to read this. Uh, maybe maybe you grew up with the Winx. Maybe you can tell me in the comments just what the hell is going on with this Winx Club thing. It sounds like they're just, it really sounds like they're just trying to sell children on this, this trading card game idea. Uh-oh, this bunny's being attacked by this evil plant. You had the munchies. Here, have some of these. Is that a drug reference? In my, in my Winx comic. So are they, oh, are they in a future time? Or is this just how th th this magic city operates with flying cars? Th this is actually rather involved in terms of, you know, giving you the dimensions of this, this world here. Yeah, I mean, this, this looks like it was... How, how much was this package here? How much do they want for this? You got to have a price on you. I mean, I did not pay... The, that price, I think I probably paid like 25 cents for this if you add it up, but where's the price? Maybe, oh, maybe this had a poly bag. I, but, you know, if this were, this seems like this would have been 3 or $4 in 2005 money. It's a fairly decent comic book. And this Big yellow dude is assaulting this woman. This is not code approved because some of the incidental violence is kind of rough, honestly. <laughs> uh, now, they couldn't, for some reason, they just couldn't make a go with Sailor Moon in this country. But Everywhere that actually did get to see Sailor Moon in the 90s became a hotbed of, of Sailor Moon activity. 
uh, it was really popular with everyone who saw it. In hindsight, it just seems like a really big missed opportunity that no one had the foresight to look at what was going on in America and think like, Sailor Moon maybe needs a push, not like put it on Toonami, actually try to sell it to its demographic. And they never really tried that. So we got puzzled and oh, we want to hear from you. So here's my question for you. What are you really into? Is it reading about your favorite fairies, shopping for the latest fashions, redecorating your room, or even writing poetry? Write a story or draw a picture of your favorite things. Well, you can't. Can't blame them for eliciting creativity from the children. So all the different fairies have different expertise. You got a one who's into computers. You got one who's into music. Okay, that makes sense. Look for the latest fashion dolls by Mattel. Oh, because Mattel, they were not. They were very, very much not getting any of that brat's money. So uh, that's what they... Uh, that's what they wanted right there. I know that much. On the floor, the, the flower one, I guess. I'm first in line at the theater to see romantic musicals, action adventures, historical adventures, anime, anything. So they already knew at this point that a, a part of their audience was uh, going to be familiar uh, with the anime stuff, even given the fact even given the fact that I know the shoujo had a, a rough time trying to break in this country, simply because uh, the manga industry that sprang up in this country after the turn of the century, uh, it was still influenced by the shape and the contours of the American comic book industry in as much as uh, they didn't know how to sell, they certainly didn't know how to sell the women. They didn't know even how to sell the little girls, the material that was built for that demographic. And so shoujo suffered in terms of outlet, in terms of popularity. I know that if you were reading shoujo at the time, you got used to book series never being finished uh, because the audience just wasn't as strong as it could have been, but it was fanatically loyal what there was of it. And you already see that bubbling up in 2005 here. So you can do your scores. They're just like one of those Cosmo quizzes, only for small children. Uh, oh, a time capsule about your, your future ambitions. Oh boy, my dream job would be, none of these are in, influencer or TikToker. Like, this is not the future we got. <laughs> Uh, beauty tricks. Inhale steam with chamomile to lighten stress right before the big test. Well, I'm sure this got some kids uh, started in the wonderful world of aromatherapy. Subscribe to Winx Club magazine. And here's an ad for the Disney Pixar trading cards. That's actually a terrible ad. Do you have to see down in the bottom here to for the logo of the company that you're actually buying upper deck cards from these books are hot do you have winks well the fairy insider will show you what it takes to be a winks stella gives out fashion advice while bloom quizzes you to see if you're a fairy or a witch or a fairy witch Pick up a copy of this or any of the other Winx Club books, which are packed with fabulous surprises like nail appliques, an iron-on, and glitter tattoos. Well, there you go. I don't think they still do the, do these guys, do they? I think the Winx have come and gone. All right. Well, that was a fun, a fun bit of comics. We pandered. We looked at a bit of history. We had an oddball in the lineup. Fun stuff. Now, uh, if you watch this channel, you may notice that I'm putting up new videos about new comics. They're called Hey Tegan, What's in the Bag? I get home from the store every week with my bag of new comics, and we go, we run them down, and we look at what's interesting. 
Uh, if you like this show, if you like any of my shows, if you like any of my writing, uh, check out my Patreon. I got tons of my writing, decades worth of my writing compiled there for you to download. Uh, what else? I got daily comic book reviews on Instagram and TikTok. I'm doing Savage Tales every Wednesday this summer. That that's turning out really good. This this past Wednesday with Savage Tales number four, uh, it's a pretty fantastic issue. One of the most interesting comic books Marvel published in the 1980s, just on its own. So it's been really fun to go back and, and revisit this the slice of history like that. Anyway, that's that's what we do on the TikTok and the Instagram. Uh, I got a podcast with Claire Napier called Utter Madness. We talk about Witchblade. We talk about the darkness. We talk about all of Top Cow Comics. Uh, and everything that goes along with it. We will be doing a special show about the uh, the new reboot for Witchblade. We're going to record it here at some point in the near future, and uh, we should have it up sometime around the release of whenever the book, I forget whenever the release date is for it. What else? And I should have something on the journal pretty soon. But even if I don't have anything new on the journal, I have literally years years and years and years of features uh, on the journal's website for you to go uh, check out to your heart's content. So just take care of yourself. It's a tough world out there right now. You got to take care of yourself so you can take care of the world better. Be kind to animals and small children. Do well and be well.